I was asked to just say a few words about what kind of event this is uh, the, from the part of the organizing team. Uh, today's talk is a part of the Buresh lecture series. Uh, this is a series that our institute uh, has been running for over three years now. And uh, that series already brought 12 uh, eminent scientists from overseas and from Europe uh, for a visit to uh, our institute. Uh, this series is named in the memory of uh, Dr. Jan Buresh, a uh, leading Czech neurophysiologist uh, who spent most of his uh, research career in our institute before passing away in 2012. Uh, so, uh, whenever you see an announcement of a Burash lecture, you can really expect a top speaker. Uh, but uh, I would also like to mention that uh, our institute is running uh, regular institute-wide seminars, uh, which are usually every Monday afternoon. Uh, and you can also find uh, excellent speakers and uh, exciting topics there. Uh, there we alternate uh, internal speakers from our institute with uh, speakers from other institutions uh, in the Czech Republic and abroad. And uh, everyone is very welcome uh, to attend uh, the Buresh lecture series uh, and also the regular seminars. Um, uh, these seminars are announced in the campus-wide uh, email uh, list and if you are from outside you can uh, easily subscribe to the announcements from the web pages of uh, our institute. Uh, today's speaker, Professor Philip Scherer, uh, is a guest of the director of the Institute of Physiology, Jan Kopetsky, who will now introduce the speaker. Mm. But, uh, thank you for this uh, nice and important introduction. And I would also like to welcome all of you. I'm also glad that so many of you could make it and you made it for a good reason. So. I'm mostly, uh, I mostly appreciate the efforts uh, Professor or Dr. Scherer, maybe he's a professor, but he's a doctor, to come here because he had to uh, land at 1 a.m. today in the morning and he made it safely to the hotel, now he is here. So I am also glad that so many prominent colleagues could make it. Uh, I would like to single out Professor Helena Ilmerová, for example, the former president of our academy, Michal Angel, the dean of the Set Faculty of Medicine. I, I could continue like that. I see three former directors of our institute. I see the director of Institute of Organic Medicine. And I see a lot of young colleagues. And I see also Dr. Scherer. Dr. Scherer is of the Swiss origin, as I learned. And he got his PhD at the University of Basel. And then he moved with his wife to the United States. And then he worked for uh, some years also at MIT, and then also at, uh, as a professor at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine in New York. And then he moved uh, some 10 years ago to Dallas, and now he is a director of the South, uh, how is it called, uh, how is it called your place? The uh, Touchstone Center. Touchstone, Touchstone Center in Dallas, which is a, uh, uh, which is a very important uh, center worldwide, well known for uh, the studies in diabetes and metabolism. And uh, in this country, we like scientometry, you know? And Professor Scherer is a nice example for us what you would like to make in your scientific career. Because if you look at his citation index, uh, I think uh, there are some more than 40,000 uh, citations to his work. And also, we have this famous age index. And some three weeks ago, it was 97. And yesterday, when I looked at it, you made it, 100. <laughs> 100. <laughs> Fantastic. 100. 100. But uh, what I like the most, uh, regarding the work of uh, Prof. Dr. Scherer, that he knows that adipose tissue is the most important tissue in our body. He knows that it is not only because it is getting accumulating, accumulated when we are getting obese, but it is important because of its intrinsic metabolism. And uh, metabolism of adipose tissue is important in people who are obese but still have no, uh, no problems uh, of, no, uh, they are metabolically healthy obese. And I think the key is in adipose tissue. And this is 
but uh, Dr. Sharon thinks also. And we also know that uh, adipose tissue metabolism and mitochondria in adipose tissue could serve as a target to treat uh, consequences of obesity. And I think this is what is uh, the talk of uh, Dr. Scherer going to be about, at least in part. So, welcome and thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you for those kind words, Jan. Uh, it's a pleasure to be in Prague. It's been uh, it's the second time for me, but last time was like 14 years ago. So it's always a beautiful city to come to, even at this time of the year. Uh, and very impressed always by Prague. So I want to tell you a little bit about um, adipose tissue physiology and why we are excited about our fat tissue. And I want to do this by sort of floating around in a number of different areas without necessarily going very deep, because if you really want to go deep, you can read publications. Uh, I want to give you more a bit of an overview over the whole thing. And we know that the adipocyte has changed its image quite a bit over the last 20, 30 years. We know that before uh, 1990, we looked at it mostly as a cell type that will respond to feeding fasting by taking free fatty acids, would esterify them, and then also in response to insulin would clear glucose from the system because it would translocate glucose transporters to the plasma membrane. And during fasting, of course, it would release free fatty acids into the system. And that was pretty much the fat cell that we knew. There was some biochemistry that went with it, but more or less it was considered to be a relatively boring and inert cell. And I think that has changed quite a bit over the last you know, a couple of years, because now we know that there's the adipocyte, even though it looks like it's all triglyceride, it is a very complex biochemical machine that will uh, produce a lot of different things, uh, including critical metabolites that we only start to learn uh, about at this point. We know more about lipids at this point, and I'm thinking lipids go beyond just palmitate going in and out. Uh, we are talking here signaling lipids that are produced. And then, of course, a new category of protein factors, protein hormones, that we tend to refer to as adipokines that are released by the fat cells and change under different physiological conditions. So, obviously, our fat stores are, this is sort of very intuitive, uh, they're a reflection of the net energy intake versus the net energy expenditure. The difference is usually, and it's usually a positive balance, uh, is being stored in the form of, of triglycerides. So the energy intake, of course, calorically dense foods. On the energy expenditure side, we have to remember that even if we lie in bed, we have a basic metabolic rate. We burn calories simply by existing. Uh, but then, of course, physical activity uh, and adaptive thermogenesis are uh, integral components of this uh, balance as well. So, if there's one thing we have learned over the last couple of years is that the health of the adipocyte is incredibly important for what we refer to as metabolic flexibility. And when we say metabolic flexibility, we mean how well the system can adapt to feeding and fasting. Because as we become obese and uh, more inert and more unhealthy, uh, that metabolic flexibility to a large extent is lost. So we want to learn how can we preserve metabolic flexibility. And if we preserve that metabolic flexibility, we have system-wide improvements. And the preservation of the metabolic flexibility is very much a, fa a function of how well we expand our, our fat mass. And we have to be fully aware of the fact that obesity, per se, is actually a, a, a defensive mechanism against excess caloric intake. And if we can't expand our fat cell, uh, uh, fat tissue, uh, we are actually in big trouble because then all these lipids end up in different tissues, including, including the liver. So the question really is, is the adipocyte our friend or our foe? Because epidemiologically, you would of course argue that there's a very strong correlation between increased obesity and increased cardiovascular risk, increased kidney, uh, uh, decreased kidney function, increased risk for cancers, 
so there's a long laundry list of things that go along with increased obesity. And he, it changes over the years. So this is a, a paper from uh, this year, actually, uh, by a Danish group. And they, they looked at the change in body mass index uh, associated with the lowest mortality. And this is something, of course, which the epidemiologists have done uh, over, over many years and have qu asked the question is, what is your optimal uh, body weight, more or less, that will ensure the longest longevity and the lowest cardiovascular risk factors. And you can see here that this changes actually uh, over, over time uh, in terms of the optimal BMI because you can have here, for instance, uh, in, in the period here, we considered the BMI of 24, the body mass index of 24 as being optimal. And then sort of this tends to uh, shift upwards basically for reasons that we don't fully understand at this point. But of course it is data like that that people will take and sort of misinterpret uh, and make the argument that after all obesity isn't all that bad. But of course that's, that's wrong. We should not endorse uh, obesity at all in terms of all its consequences because that's still out there. But we do have to remember that our fat tissue and the expansion of the fat tissue is a, po a potent uh, a protective force uh, for the system in terms of neutralizing all these toxic uh, lipids that we usually see accumulated out there. So in fact, we know most of us fall actually into the category of uh, the metabolically unhealthy obese individuals. So if you plot the insulin resistance versus fat mass, the more fat you have, the more unhealthy you probably are. But at the same time, we can talk about this group here, which is a metabolically healthy obesity, that people that are overweight, uh, sometimes obese, sometimes morbidly obese, but they don't have type 2 diabetes. And there is a big debate, of course, going on in the field. Is there such a thing as metabolically healthy obesity, or is this completely wrong? It depends a little bit on how you define it. Will the people that are overweight or obese eventually have a higher chance of developing diabetes? The answer is yes. But some of them, at the moment, cross-sectionally, when you look at their weight and their parameters in the cardiovascular side, they will be perfectly normal. So definitely in, by that criteria this exists. And perhaps the most uh, uh, important illustration of how important fat tissue is, is of course when you look at lipodystrophic individuals, people that do not have fat, or maybe people that have fat in all the wrong places. And those are the people which suffer from severe forms of insulin resistance because their natural tissue whose role it is to store energy is no longer present or functional and these uh, spillover effects uh, then take place. So when we look at these spillover effects, we know that in type 1 and certainly in type 2 diabetes, uh, the type of failure that you can see and measure is a failure at the, beta, at the level of the insulin producing beta cells. Uh, 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 Genome-wide association studies have clearly shown that many of the genes that pop up end up being beta cell specific genes. So the beta cell fails and the question is why do the beta cells fail? Well, because they have to cope with a very high level of insulin resistance. Now why do we have insulin resistance uh, and leading to this overload of the beta cell? Well, uh, from that perspective we could argue that what we refer to as ectopic accumulation of lipids uh, in that would be lipid accumulation in tissues which are not fat tissue, such as liver, muscle, beta cells, and many other cell types, that it is that ectopic accumulation of lipids that leads to the insulin resistance that we embrace there. And we accumulate these ectopic lipids mostly because we can no longer accommodate them in our fat, particularly in the subcutaneous fat. So if we can expand our subcutaneous fat, and serve, uh, have it serve as a metabolic sink, we see these metabolically healthy obese individuals that are very adept at expanding their subcutaneous fat and then keep these other tissues actually fully functional.
And in that context, of course, of this ectopic lipid accumulation, we refer frequently uh, to this phenomenon as basically lipotoxicity. So many of you are, of course, familiar with glucotoxicity, elevated glucose levels over prolonged periods of time, leading to secondary consequences. But also lipids, of course, do the exact same thing. And over time, some cell types are more uh, uh, susceptible to this lipotoxic response than others. And in particular, the, for instance, the beta cell is very susceptible to this lipotoxic damage under those conditions. Now, the question is, what goes wrong when we go from lean to obese? So how do we keep our fat tissue actually happy and functional under those conditions? So we know that there is a number of uh, important changes that take place, and I like to sort of make the comparison between an expanding fat pad with the expansion of a solid tumor mass. Uh, because in both cases you have rapid expansion and you need an infrastructure to actually ensure that it's properly uh, 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 vascularized. So frequently uh, uh, obese fat uh, is uh, characterized by some degree of hypoxia within the tissue that you can actually measure. And that hypoxia is due to the fact that the uh, angiogenic response doesn't keep up. So our fat is not properly vascularized given the rapid expansion. And that induces a, a sort of a knee-jerk reaction, like in any other cell type, uh, trying to be uh, pro-angiogenic. Uh, and they will induce factors such as HIF-1-alpha, for instance. And HIF-1-alpha will try to establish a better vasculature, but actually, even in the case of adipose tissue, it will actually cause a lot of fibrosis. And part of the reason uh, downstream of, of all of these will eventually be a sort of a classical sort of inflammatory response. And we appreciate that people with type 2 diabetes, people with the metabolic syndrome, uh, frequently have a uh, relatively high level of subclinical chronic inflammation within their system, something that the epidemiologists, again, like to link very much with the cardiovascular risk uh, uh, downstream of that. Now you can visualize that fibrosis quite effectively when you look at tissue sections. These happen to be mouse tissues, but it could be the exact same thing in humans. Uh, you can visualize it, for instance, with a, a trichrome stain here, and you can see that this dysfunctional fat over here versus the healthy fat uh, will show up as a, a streaks of collagen in the interstitial space here. So dysfunctional fat is highly fibrotic fat, so fibrosis being a hallmark of disease, much like fibrosis is a hallmark of disease in the liver or in the kidney, for instance. So this stretches to uh, the fat tissue as well. This is a relatively new concept, though, uh, which we didn't appreciate in terms of the fibrotic response uh, being active uh, in dysfunctional fat under those conditions. So because the extracellular matrix that is responsible for all that fibrosis uh, plays an absolutely essential role for the well-being of the fat tissue and the modulation, the ability of, to, to modulate the extracellular matrix is very critical to maintain proper uh, uh, function of adipose tissue. And you can see that, for instance, when you take a very prominent extracellular structural protein that is part of that ECM in, uh, in fat tissue, which is collagen-6, and you monitor now by EM here uh, the, the, the fibrillar distribution of this collagen versus uh, a mouse that doesn't have collagen 6, which doesn't have many phenotypes per se in a laboratory mouse in a cage. Uh, but it has definitely destabilized extracellular matrix components, which means that the matrix can uh, expand much more rapidly in the absence of collagen-6. So as the mouse gains weight, it actually is much more at ease to expand its fat cells in a stress-free environment. It is fat which is mechanically less stable, but that doesn't matter, of course, in the context of a laboratory animal. But from a metabolic point of view, you can feed that mouse now with a high fat diet and you can actually see with an oral glucose tolerance test that these mice that lack collagen 6, in other words, that are, ha have a high level of flexibility in the extracellular matrix, are much more uh, resistant to the negative effects uh, of a high fat diet under those conditions. So the mice that lack this, this important uh, extracellular constituents, even though they have mechanically less stable fat, 
And that's, of course, a problem in the wild, but not in the animal in the, in the, in the cage. They do have much higher metabolic flexibility uh, because they can expand now their tissues uh, uh, much more. So unlike conventional fat, where we say that large fat cells are stressed fat cells, are inflamed fat cells, in this particular model, the large fat cells are actually not stressed because there is no mechanical pressure on the fat cell during that expansion uh, period. So in a model, basically, we tried to summarize this in a couple of years ago, that when you go now from lean to obese, you can see that as long as we keep the vasculature well up with the growth, we can actually yeah. extend the period of insulin sensitivity much further out, as opposed to a fat tissue that doesn't have appropriate vascularization very quickly it becomes hypoxic and as a result it becomes fibrotic and eventually again you have much higher levels of inflammation uh, that kicks in. So there's a lot of immune related uh, uh, processes that go on in our adipose tissue here which is something we're trying to further summarize like many other people in reviews here. This one is about to come up in, uh, in the journal of uh, a clinical investigation where we actually look again mechanistically at the details in terms of the modulation of the extracellular matrix versus the infiltration of a lot of different immune related uh, cells into the expanding uh, adipose tissue where it eventually is a matter of making a call whether this expansion is going to be uh, uh, stressful or not stressful and how it's going to respond to an injury again in the form of a high fat diet for instance uh, under those conditions. So when you zoom in actually into adipose tissue uh, and this is from a collaboration with uh, Saverio Cinti's lab in, in Italy uh, you see that very frequently that you will find what looks like a fat cell surrounded by these other cells and these other cells are actually macrophages they look like foam cells in a plaque with they're very lipid laden and this is actually no longer a fat cell this is just a lipid droplet so when the fat cell dies it will actually leave behind a lot of debris including a very large lipid droplet that sits there even in the mouse for probably several weeks and it has to wait for these macrophages to come in and slowly engulf all these lipids and clear the damage. And we take this type of structure that we call a crown-like structure uh, that you see frequently in pathological fat, both in humans and in the mouse. Uh, we take that as a sign basically for a high level of local inflammation and insulin resistance under those conditions. So you can see these lipid laden uh, structures. So there's no doubt about the chronic uh, inflammatory state as being associated with insulin resistance. But at the same time, if we all go around and preach that diabetes and obesity are basically inflammatory diseases, why don't we cure diabetes with anti-inflammatories? Well, people have tried, but anti-inflammatories have turned out to be fairly ineffective in terms of improving insulin uh, sensitivity. So there has to be something else uh, to that issue of inflammation. And we asked that question a little while ago uh, because the, 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 the notion in the field was so highly indoctrinated that inflammation is a bad thing in the context of uh, uh, metabolism that we tried to basically challenge that notion and ask whether inflammation is always associated with metabolic dysfunction. And we've done that and I'll just summarize it very quickly again in the mouse genetically where we took a couple of different transgenic approaches uh, where we put potently anti-inflammatory molecules directly into the fat cells. So for instance, uh, we've used a dominant negative version of TNF-alpha, which is actually clinically used uh, as an anti-inflammatory in rheumatoid arthritis, but we've genetically uh, uh, made mice that overexpress this form. We've used a classical a uh, master anti-inflammatory uh, protein here, the ICAPA B-alpha that has been used for many years by the immunologists. And then there's an additional potent anti-inflammatory molecule uh, that we put in there that we stole from an adenovirus uh, uh, protein that made the adenovirus uses that to infect after infection of the host tissue, it will start to produce this red protein to suppress the local cellular inflammatory response post-infection. Uh, and what we found out from these studies is basically 
that the adipose tissue expansion very critically relies on an inflammatory response. Because if you inhibit inflammation at the level of the fat cells, uh, it leads to all kinds of secondary effects. We impair actually the adipogenic process per se. So these, uh, these mice that have anti-inflammatory factors in their fat fail to expand their fat appropriately under those conditions. And they have, uh, as a result of being partially lipodystrophic, they actually have these ectopic lipid depositions in the liver, so they have very fatty livers and insulin-resistant livers. They also have compromised intestinal barriers. And you can see this, the importance of local inflammatory responses, particularly in your mesenteric fat when you look at cases of Crohn's disease. And we frequently refer to these uh, the phenomenon that you see in the mesentery there as creeping fat as a result of the con constant pro-inflammatory response you actually expand the fat pad locally around the uh, mesenteric region uh, so they, the mice that don't do that basically have an impaired intestinal barrier function and you appreciate that in the context of, of obesity and diabetes you have uh, uh, impaired gastric mobility and that leads uh, combined with uh, increased uh, uh, permeability to an increased release of bacterial debris endotoxin into the system and that endotoxin is usually absorbed by the fat cell. They have very high levels of the endotoxin receptors, TLR4. If you don't have the fat cell there, it's going to spill over into circulation and it's going to hit the liver and it's going to create a, a great deal of inflammation uh, in the liver. And that's exactly what's going on in this system. Even though we have an anti-inflammatory response at the fat cell, eventually we have much more systemic uh, inflammatory response and then these mice become extremely uh, resistant uh, uh, to the effects of insulin. So we concluded from that, and this was a little bit uh, against the dogma, uh, that we need a low level of inflammation at the level of adipose tissue uh, uh, in order to properly expand and remodel the tissue and adapt the tissue uh, to change uh, metabolic states. For the immunologists, this was hardly news because they always argued that inflammation, of course, has a positive role, but for the, for the average person in metabolism, this was a little bit heretic to accept uh, because of that dogma out there that inflammation is such an important uh, insulin resistance causing uh, uh, effect. Now, what else are fat cells known for? So they uh, are now well-established secretory cells. I would almost call them professional secretory cells. They release these adipokines, and one of the adipokines that we've been working on ever since we found it in the early 1990s is a protein called adiponectin, which is released by these cells and does a lot of uh, uh, different things in circulation. We also appreciate that the adipocyte releases critical lipids, and by that I mean signaling lipids, not just structural lipids. And uh, those of you, may, some of you at least, may have heard of the sphingolipids, specifically a subclass there, the ceramides, which tend to be mentioned in the early biochemistry lectures, and then we all forget about them because they're very complex lipids and uh, we don't know where to really put them in the big scheme of things. And then also the release of critical factors that the fat cell synthesizes of in, under those contexts is important as well. Uh, and, and we're only touching upon that new class of metabolites that, that, uh, that the fat cell releases. Now, in terms of the earliest sort of fat-derived factors that emerged in the late 1980s, early 1990s, were immune-related molecules. So we uh, appreciate that uh, Bruce Spiegelman's lab established the release of TNF-alpha and a, a complement uh, cascade uh, protein uh, adipsin uh, as secretory components. Uh, but after that, it was really more and more established that the fat cell can do much more than that and actually release a lot of additional molecules. Again, in light of the fact that the extracellular matrix is so incredibly important for the, for the lifestyle of the, of the fat cell, there's a lot of uh, modifying enzymes that are being produced, including these ma uh, matrix metalloproteases, um, particularly one which I won't have time to talk about, MP1MMP or MMP14, which plays a very important role. Uh, 
Additional factors include pro-inflammatory factors, of course. These are these uh, uh, cytokines, uh, IL-6, MCP1, TNF-alpha, that we all use as diagnostics, basically. But then there are also others, including alpha-1 acid glycoprotein, that you conventionally think as being synthesized mostly in the liver. Turns out a lot of it comes from, from the adipocyte proper. And then perhaps the most exciting category of these molecules are the ones which are almost uniquely produced uh, not completely, but almost uniquely produced by the fat cell. And these include the proteins like the lipinectin uh, and leptin uh, and, and uh, a whole host of additional factors which we and others added over the course of, of a couple of years here. And it's those factors which are critically involved in the crosstalk between different organs. So for instance, the fat cell obviously talks to the liver. Uh, and we find that in the mouse, you find that clinically, whenever there is any level of dysfunction at the level of the fat cell, the liver immediately responds. The moment you have a dysfunctional fat cell, the mouse liver turns into a fatty liver and will turn eventually into an insulin resistant liver. And that communication axis uh, is again established through a lot of different factors, including leptin and adiponectin. And particularly leptin, we think of being a signal exclusively from the fat cell going to the brain. It turns out that peripheral leptin action is also uh, very important uh, under those conditions. The fat cell has to talk to the critical. Uh, uh, mediators of uh, glucagon and insulin synthesis. So the alpha cell and the beta cell in the pancreas are important targets for both leptin and again very important also for adiponectin if you want to maintain a proper balance between these, these two critical hormones, insulin and glucagon. Uh, glucagon in particular who is currently going through a revival of interest in the field as being a very important uh, sort of antidote to insulin and there are more and more people including uh, actually colleagues in my own center that would argue that diabetes is not so much uh, uh, a, 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 a dysfunction of insulin it's actually much more uh, an unopposed insulin uh, an, an unopposed glucagon action so people put glucagon more and more center stage in the context of type 2 diabetes and there's a lot of data out there that I would argue if you uh, neutralize glucagon, that the sole act of neutralizing glucagon is actually going to improve the diabetic phenotype. It's a very complex question to address. Uh, many companies have been active in that field, producing glucagon receptor antagonists or neutralizing antibodies, some of which has gone, have gone very far in the clinic. But there were issues with them, nothing is ever straightforward, but nevertheless uh, there's a lot of excitement in the field about the glucagon axis right now. So the crosstalk between the fat cell and the beta cell, and now particularly the alpha cell as well, uh, turns out to be extremely important. And then of course all these other tissues have to communicate, including the brain, uh, fat brain axis with leptin and adiponectin again, and also of course a direct uh, hormonal action between the fat cell and the heart. And there is so much to be said and talked about there. My colleague Joe Hill at UT Southwestern and myself put actually an entire compendium together this year uh, with about a dozen reviews which highlight various aspects of this communication axis between the fat cell and the cardiovascular system, emphasizing again the close relationship between the two and how the dysfunction of the fat tissue can actually lead to all these cardiovascular uh, dysfunctional uh, readouts under those conditions. But if we go back now and look at my favorite protein that we've spent uh, basically my entire career on so far uh, is, uh, is adiponectin. Fat derived and it's turned out to be an excellent tool for us at least to understand more about the physiology of the fat cell by studying what the fat cell does with a protein like adiponectin. When you look at all of these secreted molecules from the fat, you will see of course that almost every single molecule that derives from the fat got, follows the rule the more fat you have, the more of it circulates, a direct proportional response. Adiponectin is different. 
when you plot BMI versus adiponectin levels uh, in the tissue or in circulation, you'll actually see that there is a counter, somewhat counterintuitive inverse relationship between adiponectin and fat mass. So the more fat you have, the less of this fat-derived molecule is in circulation. And that tells you already that this is a very different type of molecule from all the other molecules that fat cells uh, release under those conditions. You see that this is actually not just a function of fat mass. It's actually, more importantly, a function of the quality of the fat. So when you now take a metabolically healthy individual versus a metabolically unhealthy individual, but you adjust for the exact same BMI, you'll actually find that the metabolically healthy individual has higher diponectin levels, whereas the metabolically unhealthy individual has lower diponectin levels. So it's not actually about fat mass, which happens, of course, to trail with the quality for the most part, but it's more about the quality of the fat. Now, you can take this notion of the metabolically healthy individual back to the mouse. And we've actually made over the years uh, a couple of different mouse models where we set records for the fattest mouse ever to be reported in the literature. So there was an early version of this here, which ended up being an adiponectin overexpressing mouse. And then we beat our own record by making even fatter mice under those conditions. So these would be mice, they would be the human equivalent would be approximately a 450, 500 kilogram individual. So these mice have massive amounts of fat, uh, but what makes them so interesting to study, other than they look very cute, is the fact that they are metabolically perfectly healthy. And the biggest risk that these mice have is that they roll over. <laughs> and when they roll over, that's not funny for, uh, for a mouse, because if you don't put them back, they will actually dehydrate within about 12 hours because they can no longer get to the water. But other than that, these are very, very happy mice. And you understand why these mice are so happy when you look at their fat tissue and you can actually go down a checklist uh, with these mice. What constitutes healthy fat? So when you look here, the healthy, very obese fat versus the less obese fat over here, you can see when you focus on the fat, you see that these uh, have many more fat cells and they're on average smaller. So that's still according to the textbook that if you have smaller fat cells, those are insulin sensitive fat cells uh, and, and they will uh, remain actually uh, uh, much more responsive compared to the dysfunctional fat. You will find that because it's functional fat, there's much less infiltration of immune cells. When you now plot, for instance, here for a macrophage marker, you can see all the, uh, the brown stain here. This is all a reflection of the, uh, of, of the infiltration of macrophages. You don't see that in the healthy fat. So that correlates quite nicely. So a reduced chronic inflammation. And now when you compare the fibrosis, it's exactly the same thing. You see the, the blue stain here in the dysfunctional fat. None of that is seen uh, in, the, in the healthy fat under those conditions. And every time you have functional, happy adipose tissue, the liver immediately follows suit because the dysfunctional fat leads to a fatty liver. Not so here. So we have an improved hepatic insulin sensitivity because the liver is not steatotic under those conditions at all. And because there is a high level of insulin sensitivity, if you look now in the pancreas with the, with the islets here, you can actually see the disheveled islets in the dysfunctional uh, mouse here, whereas these are fully functional, intact, healthy beta cells that pump out a lot of uh, uh, insulin under those conditions. So what we concluded from a lot of these things, and these models were all models of mitochondrial uh, changes leading to higher levels of adiponectin in circulation, we really conclude that the adiponectin levels that you measure in circulation are a direct reflection of the uh, relative health and functionality uh, and, 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 and the metabolic flexibility of, uh, of the adipose tissue and, as a result, systemic insulin sensitivity. So the reason why you have 15 or 20,000 papers on adiponectin at this point is because it ended up being an excellent marker for almost every disease phenomenon that you want to study. Uh, and it always, with very, very few exceptions, in fact, only two exceptions, 
it's always a reflection of systemic insulin sensitivity. The only two exceptions that are clinically known uh, uh, to be uh, uh, outside that rule here is uh, uh, end-stage heart disease, uh, heart failure, and that's a case of adiponectin resistance. So we have a compensatory upregulation of adiponectin. And the other system that we don't understand at this point is chronic kidney disease, which is associated with elevated adiponectin levels despite the fact that we have decreased insulin sensitivity under those conditions. So adiponectin is a very prominent circulating factor and it affects many different tissues. Uh, uh, almost no cell in the system is immune to adiponectin. The adiponectin receptors are ubiquitously expressed. And generally when you look at the effects of these tissues, it's all good news. It's always improvements in insulin sensitivity. It's always anti-inflammatory, anti-apoptotic, anti pro-angiogenic as you can see. Clinically, you can also appreciate, for instance, that lower adiponectin levels uh, are the best markers so far for uh, fatty liver disease, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. And again, we have shown that in multiple studies and others as well. We use our own Dallas Heart study for a lot of these things. And you can see in there that uh, when you plot the amount of liver fat, versus the adiponectin levels, you can actually see that there's a nice correlation there. It's not perfect by any stretch, but as you know, we don't have good markers for fatty liver in circulation. It's very difficult to diagnose unless you have uh, imaging uh, methods to, to address that. But in terms of simple circulating markers, we still lack that. And the adiponectin is probably one of the best ones at this point, where you have higher adiponectin levels associated with low uh, contents of, of liver fat. So we've tested that again in the mouse using a couple of different systems, particularly in the heart, uh, in the pancreas, and then also in the kidney for that matter, uh, where we can test the adiponectin effects more specifically. And you can see that, for instance, when you now take one of these models. Uh, this is a mouse model in which we can inducibly uh, produce a high level of apoptosis in the heart and as a consequence the mice will actually die if you overdo that and that dose response uh, when you look at survival versus hours after the uh, after the the insult here where we produce this this apoptosis there's a certain uh, sort of death rate that goes along uh, with that system and we know that mice that overexpress adiponectin are more resistant to that than mice that have only half the dose of adiponectin or no adiponectin at all. They become very, very susceptible to that type of naturally occurring endogenous apoptosis. So the same system can actually be used in the pancreatic beta cell. Uh, so uh, we can uh, kill beta cells by inducing apoptosis. Uh, we call these the panic attack mice. Uh, this is a system that we've published on extensively. And you can see that when you actually induce apoptosis in the beta cell, your plasma glucose levels go up. Uh, and we can do this in such a way that all genotypes here, whether it's our type of adiponectin, overexpressing adiponectin mice or, or uh, adiponectin null mice here, that they all basically reach the same level of hyperglycemia because we killed their beta cell. Then we stop the insult and we let the system recover and you can actually see very nicely that in the adiponectin overexpressing mouse, the beta cell mass comes back. It is reconstituted and it restores euglycemic uh, 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 glucose levels under those conditions, which is, uh, of course, uh, in its own right, very important in terms of beta cell regeneration in the context of both type 1 and type 2 diabetes. And last but not least, without giving you any details, we can do the exact same thing in another critical cell type in the kidney, the podocyte, for instance. We can induce massive kidney dysfunction by killing the podocytes, and then we look at the recovery of the kidney post-insult, and we find that when we have a mouse that has a little more adiponectin in circulation, and these are all 
models with modest overexpression, this will be a two to threefold elevation of adiponectin that you can usually easily achieve, for instance, with a PPA gamma agonist, which is a, an anti diabetic. You can see that that is sufficient to reconstitute uh, uh, kidney function under those conditions as well. So we learned from all of these experiments that here we have a fat-derived molecule, and that fat-derived molecule has potent anti-apoptotic actions, which are very important, of course, for these critical cell types affected by diabetes. It's pro-angiogenic. It actually ensures proper vascularization of the fat itself. Uh, it, it can be uh, anti-atherogenic, hundreds and hundreds of papers from the clinic argue that higher diponectin levels will predispose you to a lower risk of cardiovascular disease over time. It's potently anti-inflammatory, it's pro-adipogenic, you saw that we have many more but smaller fat cells under those conditions and as a result of all of that it improves insulin sensitivity, uh, at particularly in many different uh, cell types including the liver. And not mentioned here, it can actually also improve uh, wound healing. So with all of these things, uh, we, we wondered what is the underlying mechanism that would ensure that a single protein can do so many different positive things. So the uh, study of adiponectin has led us back uh, to these lipids, actually, to these ceramides uh, that turn out to be very uh, important uh, uh, in metabolism as well. The ceramide axis is a bit complicated because ceramides are important structural lipids. We all have a lot of them in the, lip, in, in the skin, for instance. There's no, every skin lotion contains ceramides. But uh, in other tissues and cell types, ceramides have uh, been shown to play a very important role in inducing cell death, inducing inflammation, and inducing insulin resistance. Now, with a single conversion from, for a, a degradation step, uh, with the ceramidase, we can convert the ceramides into a sphingosine derivative, sphingosine phosphates here, and the sphingosines are actually exactly the opposite. They are proliferative, promitogenic, pro-survival lipids, and that's why the cancer people have been very interested in these molecules, and it's a typical example of the dichotomy uh, between metabolism and cancer, because in cancer, you want more ceramides in order to kill the tumor cells and make it more susceptible to, uh, uh, to treatments with, with uh, uh, chemo, chemo treatments, whereas uh, in metabolism we want less. And the cancer people ha are afraid of sphingosine phosphate because it's pro-mitogenic, whereas in metabolism we embrace that action actually because it helps us improve insulin sensitivity. So it turns out that adiponectin uh, is a potent ceramide lowering agent in almost every single cell that we've looked at. You can, for instance, measure hepatic ceramides here, and you see that in a, let's say, the diet-induced model over here, you put a mouse on a high-fat diet, from lean to obese, the ceramides go up, and if you add recombinant adiponectin or you have transgenic versions, uh, you normalize uh, the levels under those conditions again. Uh, if you look in the heart, you see the same thing, inverse proportionality between adiponectin levels in the different genotypes here versus the levels of, uh, of, of the ceramide. So the more adiponectin you have, the less ceramide is in the system, basically. This is pharmacologically actually very important uh, because we know now that clinically as well, ceramides are elevated in type 2 diabetics. You can measure ceramides in plasma of type 2 diabetics. Uh, they won't do anything in plasma, of course, functionally. They will act in the cells, but as a, a, a diagnostic agent, we can actually measure these ceramides in plasma, and they're elevated in type 2 diabetics. And they're connecting the lower ceramides. We've shown that now very clearly. Another important pharmacological tool is FGF21. A lot of people work on FGF21 at this stage, and it turns out that FGF21 also lowers ceramides, and it lowers ceramides by increasing adiponectin. And last but not least, the important and almost forgotten anti-diabetic agent, the PPA gamma agonist, the, the thiosolidine diones that used to be widely used before they came in some form of disrepute, uh, due to cardiovascular side effects, which ended up not being particularly relevant. Uh, so the, the TZDs will actually induce FGF21 
which induces adiponectin, which lowers ceramide action. So TZDs are also anti uh, uh, ceramide, uh, potent anti ceramide action agents. And you can see this again clinically. Uh, this is from a Lilly study. Lilly uh, was working for some time very extensively in generating a clinically uh, uh, acceptable form of FGF21. Uh, for patients and that went pretty far in clinical studies and you can see here that the injection of FGF21 will actually lead to a very dramatic increase uh, at the level of adiponectin. So there's a straight linear relationship between uh, these factors. So the, the signaling events have been reasonably well worked out and I don't want to drag you through a adiponectin receptor signaling pathways here but suffice it to say that we have reason to believe that uh, the adiponectin now will potently activate what we refer to as a ceramidase activity, which is an activity that lowers ceramide and creates more of these fingerzine one phosphates. And we can now prove that, because that's still not necessarily absolutely uh, uh, proven, uh, with various uh, genetic models uh, that put this uh, to the test, including the uh, activation of things, a classical uh, acid ceramidase or the adiponectin receptors. And I'm going to just fly through this to make the point now towards the end that this turns out to be a new approach towards developing uh, novel anti-diabetic strategies, hopefully, uh, for the future. And a number of pharmaceutical companies are being active in that area. Without giving you the gory details, it looks very complicated, but it's very simple. What we've done here is uh, generated uh, either a liver-specific or a diposite-specific uh, overexpression model of acid ceramidase, where we can induce it by giving the mouse doxycycline that will activate the gene and it will uh, improve uh, uh, very rapidly uh, uh, the insulin sensitivity, whether you put the ceramidase into the liver or whether you put it into the fat cell, actually doesn't matter. Improvements in insulin sensitivity uh, are rapidly achieved and uh, I'm not going to show you any data because we published that last year in, in cell metabolism. Now if you're right and the adiponectin receptors do the same thing, we should be able to do the exact same thing and achieve uh, uh, improvements in insulin sensitivity. And the short answer is again, yes, we can. And it's exactly like overexpressing uh, an acid ceramidase. Similar inducible model for the adipocyte in this particular case, where we overproduce the receptors under those conditions. And you can rapidly see improvements in insulin sensitivity by oral glucose tolerance tests. Ceramidase activity goes up under those conditions and you improve triglyceride uh, uh, patterns here. This is an oral triglyceride garage that becomes more effective here. As in all of these cases, the hepatic lipids go down, the hepatic insulin sensitivity goes down, and the overexpression of the receptor lowers serum ceramides, as well as ceramides within the adipose tissue, as well as within the liver. So across the board, a very rapid improvement. So you have to look at these overexpression models as basically a bathtub full of ceramides that causes insulin resistance. You pull the plug, you train the ceramides down, and insulin sensitivity improves. And it turns out it doesn't matter whether you pull the plug at the level of the uh, adipocyte or whether you uh, pull the plug at the level of uh, the uh, liver. And you can do this by overexpressing the ceramidase directly, by overexpressing the receptor 1, uh, or they're overexpressing the receptor 2. Uh, uh, and you can do this again in both, both systems there. So bottom line is, um, whatever it is that we do, we want to be nice to our fat cells because it's our fat cells that really determine the metabolic health of the entire system. So the expansion of uh, fat tissue is a, an important protective force. <coughs> Excuse me. But potent uh, 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 protective force and given the fact that we all eat too much, and we found out that so far at least, uh, we can't do very much pharmacology, pharmacologically about food intake, unless uh, someone locally here might change that in terms of uh, having an effective uh, anti, uh, um, uh, an, appetite, an appetite suppressant. But again, it's very difficult because of the close relationship between depression and food intake. But if we accept the fact that we cannot change the amount of food taken in, 
uh, obesity in that context, we really have to view it as a protective response. And we are all obese, but one could argue we are not obese enough to actually accommodate all these extra calories in our fat. So we want to learn more about that physiology of the fat cell. And then I want to end up with this last sort of slide here that just tells you the fat cell as an important player in the metabolic response that I've just spent a whole hour talking about that. But we also have to be increasingly susceptible to the idea that the, the fat cell is a target for infectious disease. A number of uh, parasites actually enjoy infecting fat cells, including, for instance, uh, a, a parasite that we've been working on for quite some time now, uh, which is Trypanosoma cruzi, the causative agent of a Chagas disease, which is again associated chronically uh, with uh, cardiomyopathies, well established. Increasingly, Chagas disease is seen in southern, the southern part of the United States as well as it creeps up from Central and South America. And uh, these bugs will go through an acute phase uh, that causes high fever uh, and a lot of dysfunction, but then they go over to a chronic phase for decades in humans where they hide away in cells and they will actually hide away in the fat cells. And they will break out. You can actually see here uh, these, these T. cruzi coming out of the fat cell. Uh, this, is, this is like a picture from aliens or something as they creep out. It's very scary. And as such, there's a whole new physiology here of infectious disease. And it's not limited to T. cruzi. There are bacteria, malaria, and many other forms that actually are increasingly uh, focused on as uh, being infectious agents for the fat cell as well. And then this is a very important uh, area as well. Metabolism is increasingly moving to, towards cancer metabolism at this point, a newly emerging field that's very actively worked on. Uh, the question that we were tackling now for quite a few years is what constitutes the connection between increased body mass index, obesity, and increased cancer risk. So when you're obese, you have an increased cancer risk uh, almost for every single cancer, but it's particularly prominent for endometrial cancer. It's the most obesity-prone cancer type there is, up to a six-fold higher risk in, in endometrial cancer, postmenopausal breast cancer, uh, colon cancer, pancreatic cancer, they all have a strong obesity component to it. What is the connection between obesity and increased cancer risk and worse prognosis once you have the cancer? That's not known, not known at all. Is it the inflammation? Is it these adipokines? Is it the increased level of extracellular matrix? We study this quite extensively in the context of breast cancer, where we follow the interaction of the tumor cells in the breast with the surrounding fat cells. And that's very important in terms of that microenvironment, and it goes way beyond uh, the uh, estrogen hormonal effects that we are used to. With that, I think my time is over, and I want to thank uh, the people in my lab here, uh, and I've highlighted the work of some of these individuals here. I have a, a bunch of former postdocs that are now assistant professors and which have contributed to, uh, to, to some of that work, and a very outstanding group of colleagues at UT Southwestern, where we've always had historically a very strong metabolism group uh, in the area of cardiovascular disease as well as uh, type 2 diabetes. And with that, I want to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for the opportunity talk. I like it very much. I like a lot of aspects of it, like how nicely you could explain the interactions between adipocytes and the other tissues and all these new aspects like the link to cancer and inflammation and ceramides. Thank you. We would need uh, much more time than one hour, of course, because adipose tissue is the most important tissue in the body. It is. We both agree on that, right? But uh, <laughs> we, we still have time for discussion now and then later on at 4 o'clock, uh, 4 in the afternoon. If you are interested, we can continue the discussion at uh, the Institute of Physiology at the uh, conference uh, room uh, at the ground floor close to the rector's office. So now we will have a short discussion, then we will have a refreshment, everybody is welcome, and then we can continue later on. So now some, some questions to... Okay.
do you have any idea why these anti-inflammatory drugs have no effects in patients? That yeah, that's happens? been a mystery. Why the anti-inflammatories are ineffective? And some people will disagree with that statement and say, well, there are some cases where anti-inflammatories had some effect. But we like to think of TNF-alpha as a very prominent agent, uh, neutralizing uh, TNF-alpha action, NBREL, all of these completely ineffective from a metabolic point of view. Um, we believe that increasingly the field, as much as we all gravitated to inflammation, um, we increasingly think that inflammation may not be the area for, for, for therapeutics, uh, for reasons which are just the they don't work, and we don't fully understand why they don't work, but um, it's, it's definitely uh, not the area, and we'd like to think of it more and more as just uh, inflammation is associated with insulin resistance, and it doesn't necessarily have to be the causative agent of it. So it's, it's a, a, an important question to which actually I, nobody really has a good answer to. I'd like to ask you a question related to the tumor genesis and the adipose tissue. So as you have mentioned, for example, the endometrial carcinoma is a high risk if you in a woman which are obese. So but you have so you don't know the factors which are responsible for that. But what was interesting when you showed the effect of the adipolectins. So for example, they are preventing apoptosis, they increase the angiogenesis. Uh, so I, I assume those would be, for example, the, the negative effects of the therapeutic use, for example, that they could... Absolutely agreed, yes. And in fact, we and others have shown that if you... We've shown that tumors can grow... That tumors grow more slowly in the adiponectin null mouse. Uh, and the same for leptin. Leptin is a very important factor. Now, this is in contrast, you would argue, to the epidemiology. Uh, a lot of people have measured adiponectin and say, okay, high adiponectin predisposes you to a lower breast cancer risk. And that's true too. But you're measuring obesity when you measure ob adiponectin, and you do nothing more than connect obesity with breast cancer risk. At the molecular level, uh, it seems to me that for the reasons that I pointed out, adiponectin is not potentially not a good therapeutic from the perspective of changing the balance of ceramide to sphingosines. You have excess sphingosine under those conditions. And in fact, in the heart, we see that. Sphingosine has been uh, uh, associated with uh, um, cardiac hypertrophy. If you look at our diponectin overexpressing mice, they actually have cardiac hypertrophy. So it can affect, depending on the tissue, it can potentially affect uh, these readouts quite significantly. And like with any metabolic intervention, without exception almost, I think the only exception I can think of is metformin that has uh, uh, improvements in metabolism and seems to be protective uh, from uh, for, for cancer with every other except uh, with every other case I think our attempts to improve insulin sensitivity uh, from a diabetic perspective are sometimes associated with increased uh, not necessarily tumor initiation but tumor progression in terms of improving that vascularization Professor, uh, just uh, two questions first about connections between beta cell and alpha cells as you showed uh, previously. There's a lot of uh, uh, knowledge about the GABA expression in beta cell and influencing of uh, this connection between beta and alpha by, uh, by GABA signaling. My, question, my first question is uh, if you know something about adiponectin uh, influence of GABA in beta cell and perhaps possibility to influence this it's a very good question. I don't think there's literature between adiponectin and GABA, but you're absolutely right with the GABA receptors. What I can tell you and what I didn't show you is that if you take an adiponectin null mouse, that mouse, even though metabolically challenged and it doesn't cope well with high-fat diets, the mouse is alive. The only time the mouse dies is when you take the insulin away. So if you take an adiponectin null mouse and you treat it with streptocytosin and eliminate the insulin, it's going to almost immediately die from extremely high triglycerides. Uh, 
So the condition of lack of insulin and lack of adiponectin is absolutely not tolerated. Uh, and that's when, you know, that's the type of question we like to study, but increasingly the crosstalk between the alpha cell and the beta cell uh, plays an important role and how the two of them regulate in each other and does the alpha cell become in that sense insulin resistant and that's why the glucagon goes through the roof. Uh, those are all questions which are very intensely worked on right now at the Touchstone Center by various groups. The other question is about, uh, you have spoken about inflammation in, in adipose tissue but mostly from the side of adipocytes. Uh, the other a basic player are macrophages. There is a lot of work now about the chemokines, recept uh, chemokines and chemokine receptors in macrophages. And my question is if you know something about the possibility of the blockade uh, of uh, those chemokine receptors or perhaps reprogramming of those uh, perhaps not right. so active uh, macrophages in the adipose tissue. It, it, very important. Pathology. Absolutely, you're right, they're very important. And in line with that, every single systemic knockout of a member of the NF-kappa B cascade from the receptor all the way into the P65, P52s, P50s, in every single case, a mouse that lacks components of this signal transduction cascade is resistant to high-fat diet mediated insulin resistance. So they do better. Uh, but that's the systemic knockouts, and our point was that local knockouts don't necessarily do that. So, but, but uh, by definition, the macrophage plays an important role. A lot of other immune cells play an important role. You can eliminate the macrophage and improve uh, insulin sensitivity short term, but of course you lack sort of the garbage truck of the system, so over the course of a couple of weeks, disaster uh, uh, strikes. Uh, so you need those macrophages to, to clean up the mess. But short term, you, you remove them, you get more insulin sensitive. That's true. I, I would like also to have one question. I like polio cartoons except for one. Uh -oh. This was the comparison of the healthy, smiling adipocyte and the sad, the bad guy. Uh -huh. and both of them had the same amount of mitochondria. See mitochondria per cell. Oh. And I, think <laughs> I didn't pay attention. Yeah, I, I agree, I agree. <laughs> the attention to detail is, uh, is, is very important and we did not pay attention to detail there. It, we recycled the same fat cell and we shouldn't have done that. <laughs> Yeah, so I mean, now fashionable issue is uh, calorie restriction and life extension. And the question here would be, is there any connection with this adipos adiponectin and fasting in mice? And what happens, let's say, to autophagy or whether there is a positive correlation there? Yeah, again, very important questions. Adiponectin tends to go up in the fasting state a little bit, not very dramatically. Uh, caloric restriction, definitely massive upregulation of adiponectin. We have started, as of two weeks ago, a new grant that studies adiponectin in the context of longevity. And it turns out, I used to have a colleague at um, uh, Albert Einstein who studied Ashkenazi Jews, uh, a population of centenarians. And when you measure adiponectin in the centenarians, they all have extremely high adiponectin levels. You would argue naturally because when you're 100 years old, you're short, you have very little fat, your adiponectin will go up. But what's interesting is that the offspring of the centenarians, that would be around 70 at that stage, half of them had high adiponectin levels, half of them had normal adiponectin levels. And the prediction will be that the ones with high adiponectin will actually be the ones that make it to 100 years because there's a very strong hereditary component to longevity. So it is a longevity gene and we're now starting to study this more systematically. The relationship to autophagy, again, very important, but I don't think this has been touched upon in any uh, de significant detail. Okay, I think we should stop here. I actually, uh, uh, so I just would like to ask you what do you think, let's say, about some papers now which appear about uh, the uh, interconnection between adiposity and the synchrony of the whole circadian system or about 
uh, deposited about about being obese uh, uh, micro uh, microbiota because it seems to me that this is also a very important question how let's say microbiota can change this so we have the microbiota and then it was the circadian right. rhythm basically and we just talked about that over lunch in terms of the importance of the in circadian machinery in the adipocyte proper as well. People have knocked out PMAL and others, and it had catastrophic metabolic uh, consequences. So that is a very important aspect. The micro microbiota, I haven't touched upon simply because that's one of the areas I decided I am not going to work in. Uh, not because it's not important, but it's a completely different type of science. All of you know that the, it is. <laughs> that you, he said that, not me. Um, so the, the microbiota has by now, I would say, uh, it's a very popular topic to study. There is no doubt that there is some form of correlation between certain types of bacteria with metabolic dysfunction. Uh, people will argue that the microbiota, in terms of sheer numbers of bacteria, outnumbers our own cells. There are important sources for metabolites that are being released into the system. Uh, uh, so from that perspective, it is uh, a difficult area to work in uh, because it changes. It's a moving target all the time. And uh, there's certainly a lot of uh, action out there at the moment. And some people argue that one of the next Nobel Prizes will be about you know, the fact that we started to appreciate the microbiota as our alter ego that we carry around. And for better or for worse, if you have a healthy insulin sensitive individual, you can take his or her microbiota, which whatever is a euphemism for something else, and you move that over and uh, you can actually confer a better metabolic phenotype by quote-unquote transplanting microbiota from, from one place to the other. But it's an important point. So some more questions right now. If not, I, I'm sure that everybody agrees that it was a good idea to be here. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 The first will be brave enough to continue at 4 a.m. p.m. 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 at the uh, hour <laughs> And now everybody is very time for the uh, refreshment. Thank you. Take all my wires off here. <laughs> <laughs>